Welcome to the Wellness Revolution Podcast. Welcome to the Wellness Revolution again. I'm Dr. Veronica, your host, and we're going to jump right in. You're going to love this. This is a little bit different conversation, but you know we always have a little bit different conversation. Mm -hmm. I have on with me a lady who is a Buddhist African-American, which is just different in a, of itself. But her life is about racial justice. She has a new book called Racial Dharma. It's about getting rid of all the mess that's going on in order to be able to live fully into who you are and who America can be. We got to get over this stuff. And so this can, why is it important? Because, and why am I talking to her? Because I believe that the reason that Americans are so sick is because they're spiritual and emotionally sick. So they're physically sick because the bottom of your health is your emotions. There's emotions, there's that triangle, emotions, structure, and physiology. We focus on the physiology. What diet do I eat? What supplements do I take? How much do I exercise? The structure, you know about that, how your body's put together and sometimes that's not so good and we have to fix that. But that emotional piece, we don't talk about Harley at all. In our whole country, we have been founded on injustices that continue to go on. The country is sad, it's angry, and it's affecting our health. And so I bring to you this lady who's, who's a Brooklynite. <laughs> uh, I bring to you this lady because she's living her life differently, but her life is dedicated towards helping other people. So. I welcome Angel Coyoto Williams. What do you like to be called, Coyoto, or what is it, Reverend? Yeah, Reverend Angel is usually what people call me in public. Reverend Angel, and that fits so perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so Reverend Angel, first, I wanna find out, how did you come to where you are today? Give us a little bit of background on your journey to Buddhism. Uh, so I, I just want to start by saying like I'm not the biggest like proponent I don't sort of wave Buddhist flags a lot but you know there it is it, it, it is was it a choice for my life at some point that has uh, really impacted the way that I think and relate to the world that I think may be different than uh, many of us uh, Many, many years ago, I was a young person. I still lived, I, I now split time between Berkeley and, and Brooklyn, uh, Berkeley, California, and Brooklyn, New York. And, but at the time, I lived in New York. I'm a stone-cold New Yorker. Uh, I'll come back here all, always and forever. Uh, and, you know, like many young people that are trying to make some sense of life and like what it's about and really is this it <laughs> is this all there is to it uh and and the sense of like striving and like is is that what this is about like figuring out how to network and it was sort of that era right everybody was talking about how to network and how to get ahead and it was all about like competition uh and this didn't quite feel right to me um and i was also politicized right about that time. And so I became very aware of feminism. Uh, my generation, Generation X, was considered the most, we were supposed to be the most apathetic generation. We turned out to be the most uh, active generation politically. But I went on a cross-country voter registration drive. Uh, we, we did this great, uh, you know, cross-country thing where we vote, registered, you know, 20,000 people to vote. Uh, but I came out on the other side of that as well. So the, you have my politics and the sort of like economic, financial, so, social location things were both alive for me then. And in the politics, everybody was like us versus them. We're the better ones. They're the worst ones. Like, you know, it was like good versus evil. And I just didn't think the world could possibly be that black and white literally, right? And uh, same thing around the lines of race. And, and I've stumbled across this book and it was called Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. And that book, I'm gonna pause for a second, there's a fairy, which is very nice. Come ah. on. Uh, 
so that book uh, really felt like, you know, I, I, I have said most recently, it's like the, the lyrics to the song that Roberta Flack sings, you know, it's killing me softly. It's like someone was, had, had written my life and looked into my life and, and, and that's how the book struck me. Uh, it, and, and what I found out is that I didn't struck other colored folks in the same way. They were like, okay, this book, I, like, I can't even make sense of it. But it, it struck me and touched me very deeply. It was by Shunru Suzuki, um, a Japanese man. Of course, I, you know, not, not met him, didn't have any history with Japan, but this book really spoke to me. Wow. So what was your upbringing culturally? Was, is this just really outside of what your upbringing was? Um, I think in, in many ways, uh, in, in some ways I say I wasn't brought up. I, I mean, I grew up with my dad early on uh, and I lived with my mother in, you know, into my tweens and, and teens. And it, in that way, I ended up being a kind of like on the bridge. I lived on the Brooklyn Bridge really and going back and forth. And in that way, I got to define and shape a lot of who I, who I was because I straddled so many things. So I straddled Brooklyn and Manhattan. Uh, I left the kind of, at the time, harshness of Flatbush Brooklyn and went to live uh, with my mom. And I went to a school that was 95% ethnic Chinese. Uh, so I was very different in that. Uh, in my early life, I, I lived in Left Rock City, and it was kind of like a united nations of cultures. And in Tribeca, where my mom lived, there it was just like you, you heard languages. So routinely, you were hearing Spanish and French, and you could hear some German and some Italian. So I really had a sense of an amorphous, uh, you know, capacity to construct my own identity. And, and at the same time, I grew up in, a, you know, a, a sort of vari various spectrums, I would say, along the black mixed race, you know, community spectrum. Interesting, because, you know, I grew up and, you know, my, I, I realized now that it was in a very unique community that was very, very, very multicultural. Um, and also, my parents were just very open and flexible, even though they both grew up in Philadelphia, my father relatively poor. And, you know, my mother was adopted by a family and mm. ended up, you know, in a middle-class kind of nice family. It was, a, it was a background that made them both open and flexible. And then as in raising their children, it was just all about whatever the world was offering, take advantage of it. There's so much opportunity. Mm. Um, and, but from a religious standpoint, um, somehow my parents decided to be Catholic. And so thus I was baptized Catholic, even though my mother grew up as a, a, a traditional African-American Baptist, my father as a AME Zion, African Methodist Episcopal Zion. <laughs> they decided to be Catholic. So here I am, Veronica, <laughs> named after a saint. Um, so just being a <laughs> black Catholic when I was growing up was different. But then when we decided that wasn't working for us, it was like, okay, move on. Let's figure out what else is working. So. Um, and, and my mother was an exploratory type person. I remember her young exploring yoga and things like that. Um, and just traveling, she would go and travel. Um, she got her, she went to college while I was young. So I saw her and went to her both my parents' college graduations. And then uh, mm. she was traveling all over the world and she'd come back with all these um, gifts and pieces from around the world, which made me say, oh my God, I, I got to know, mm. which was very different than a lot of people grow up culturally where they're in a little tiny world. So thus, I've always been open. Now, as an adult, though, I've taken a path where at this point in my life, I do something that's totally bizarre and weird to a lot of people, especially to my, let's call it native culture of African-Americans. Okay, so now I'm a medical intuitive, I'm a clairvoyant. I don't know many, I can't, I don't even know anybody else who does this kind of stuff, but you know, I'm a psychic, <laughs> okay? I, I'm a psychic that's, you know, a high-end psychic, 
Um, and I notice a lot of times when I walk within the community of people who look like me, it's like, that ain't real. That's of the <laughs> devil. Um, you don't, you know, there's, there's been sometime a wholesale attack about everything about me, everything about me. <laughs> okay. Have you experienced that from people who look like you? Uh, you know, when my first book came out, uh, Being Black, many years ago, it's been about 17 years ago, I did a tour. And there was at some point at which I went to uh, Atlanta, and I went on a show, and it was a Christian show. And there was some, like, you know, edge and that I didn't quite understand uh, as as I was meeting the host and, you know, in the in the radio station. And at some point, someone said something about, you know, going to college and then going to do that, you know, uh, like uh, white religion. And I said, oh, I didn't actually, I said, actually, I didn't finish college. And somehow the, 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 the wall, the sense of like, there's a really big difference between us uh, seemed to crumble. So there was, there was something about like, I, I had chosen perhaps something that was about uh, aligning myself more with white culture. And when, when that wasn't there, when the person got really the story, I think that that, that disappeared. And since then, I, the, it, it's not been my experience, but you know, I think I'm really rather formidable. So if somebody's trying to attack, I don't think they're gonna try to do it in my face. Yeah. I get it. I, I get it from behind the scenes. You know how social media is. People don't do this in your face. They do it from behind their computer screen or cell phone. <laughs> no, I get it from actually white folks more. I, you know, I think that there's, uh, uh, I think w there are white folks that, be especially because I'm uh, pressing at the edges of r racial justice and, you know, talking about white supremacy that I get more, more friction from white communities than I do from black communities, actually. Ah, so let's talk about that racial justice, because this is something where um, those of us who walk the world in different color skin, we experience a, a different life and people want to say, you're paranoid, um, you know, you need to do life this way, or, so this won't happen to you. Mm -hmm. What made you decide to go on that pathway of pressing racial justice? Because there are people who go into their religious community and blend in and never talk about these issues, but yet you are in your face about these. How did that start? Uh, you know, for me, I can't, I live in bridge worlds and I, I, I always have, uh, but integration is really important to me to not live in a sense of being split. And so within my Buddhist communities and Zen communities, it was, you know, yeah, 95%. I mean, there were like no colored folks and like one Latino I'd run across and then there'd be like one black person that I heard about lived in California somewhere. I was in New York at the time. And I would begin to like invite people that I knew and that I was connected to and they'd come in and they'd be like, yeah, I don't know about this. And I realized that it wasn't so much about the philosophy itself, but rather they didn't have a, an experience of welcoming, you know, within these the communities. And so I asked about it and I inquired about why is it that we don't have more colored folks for, you know, what is basically, I mean, many people think of it in a religion in a sense in the world scene, it is religion, but in the U.S. in particular, Buddhism is much more like a philosophy, a way of life. It's something that people can live within that philosophy and have it coexist with their Judaism, with their Christianity with their uh, many other other things, and so there was no good reason really that it should there should be a dearth of people of color. And you know, many years later, I would just say that we see that now because there is a huge influx of young people of color uh, and older folks that you know couldn't make that make that step at the time that are coming into the practice. But I leaned into racial justice because. Uh, 
you know, that is the life that we live. And I wanted to have a conversation about how is it that a philosophy, that a teaching that is so not oriented in a way that makes sense that it would still be racially stratified, that white supremacy would still dominate, that patriarchy would still dominate with inside of it. Like, what is that about, right? It's like that, that didn't come from within the religion itself. In fact, Buddha was known for breaking with caste, which is the racial divide of his time. Uh, and so I, I pressed and I wanted to know what it would be like. And simultaneously, which, which was the reason I wrote my first book, I wanted to create a welcoming for people of color to access a teaching, a way, a, you know, a, not in a religious sense, I'm not trying to convert people, but actually find some tools and teachings and, and, and ways of looking at life that could be really valuable to people that are persistently put in a position of suffering, uh, be put in, in the position of being in contact and uh, confrontation with the institutional structures of our country and our society. Yeah, so I, I had this wonderful experience last year where one of my friends invited me to see the Dalai Lama out in California. So I got on the plane and went out there and she, you know, she had press passes and all this other kind of stuff. So you could be up close. I ended up not being up close. I ended up going inside because it was so hot, but it was a Vietnamese community. And, you know, listening to the Dalai Lama is one thing. He always has something very profound but practical to say. The best part of the experience, though, was being inside among those people, mm -hmm. mostly Vietnamese, who just took care of me so well mm -hmm. that I was like, I never experienced this type of feeling. I never experienced even in my own community, even when I've walked into African-American church with people who are like my mother and grandmother, I've never felt this well taken care of. What's going on here? Um, it was the most amazing experience with, you know, the little ladies, you know, the senior citizens next to me taking care of me, saving my seat, making sure I got food, telling me what everything was. Um, you know, when they said, okay, it's time for lunch. And then they said, stay where you are. We're going to serve you lunch. And there were thousands of people there and they started bringing out the lunch. I was like, what is this? <laughs> what is this? How come I had to wait so long in life to have this feeling of community? And yet when I look around, I see maybe one or two other people who look like me. It was just something where I was like, we, everybody needs to experience this. Like yeah. you feel like you belong. Yes. Um, so you talk about this transformative change. And I believe America needs a huge transformation. And I believe people are hating and feeling disenfranchised of all races. And so we're fighting each other because we're feeling, what do we do but fight each other? It's like the little people fighting the little people. Um, but if we come together and realize we're all working for the same thing and we're all the same, that's going to be transformative change. Mm -hmm. So what do you mean by transformative change? Well, well, what I mean by transformative change is that when we uh, take a position that we have the answer and that we should just go in and tell people what it is that they need, we're objectifying those people, whether we're going in and, uh, you know, it's like, we're gonna go and fix these like, you know, run down neighborhoods and this is what they need and they ought to do this and they ought to do that. And, you know, we know better for them. Transformative change is about, you know, and, and it's also like in that process, we bring our own stuff. We bring up the things that we haven't worked through in our own lives, our fear, our pain, our wounds, all of that is brought to bear on the work, even though we're trying to do good work and, and positive work in the world. If we don't, and this, you, you touched on this right from the beginning, if we don't work with the sort of emotional underpinnings of our internal life and don't sort them out and kind of get to see like what is seeping out, what's finding its way like out into the world in such a way that it's actually hindering the work that I do or it is getting in the way of the work that I do. So transformative change is about 
learning to uh, res honor your inner life and that we have, that we're, we're whole systems in which our inner life, our inner thoughts, our beliefs, the traumas that are small and large and wounds that we carry both, hist both uh, from our current life and also in, into our past lives and historical are affecting how we show up in the world. They, and, and if we are truly committed to changing the world, then we want to know that inner life because it, in fact, it drives us. It drives us more than whatever it is that we think we want to do or how we think we want to show up. At, in the driver's seat is that inner life. And so transformative change is about connecting our inner life to our sense of what is possible for social justice and social change in the world. And part of that is allowing ourselves also to be um, affected by the people that we serve, that we don't have a sense of like, oh, I'm serving you and so I'm in a better position, but rather I'm in relationship with you. I'm in relationship with your suffering and your pain in the same way I'm now in relationship with my own. And as a result, the, the impact and what we get out of that is emergent. It, it, some, it, it produces something that is more holistic, more true, more honoring of all of the people that are involved and the planet, Thank, you know, hopefully. So, so I'm, ask, I'm gonna ask you a question off the script, but I know that you can, you're gonna have something to say about this. One thing I've noticed in my American experience is there are a lot of people who are Caucasian who wanna help, but they don't seem comfortable helping in America where it's needed. And so they enjoy going to other countries. And, and I think everybody, a lot of people need help, i.e. the continent of Africa and doing all this stuff, adopting kids, setting up water. I, I believe all that stuff is needed and everybody deserves. But I noticed that these people who will set up these fabulous organizations um, and, and charitable ways that may or may not work, but you know, they're, they're, their intent is good. Uh, when they come back to America, they don't even have any black friends. <laughs> What's going on with that? What do you think is going on with that? Because, you know, I've seen people, I'm like, yeah, that's all well and good. And I, I've been, my, my husband's West African. I've been to Africa. I know they need stuff. But you're not willing to go to Chicago and help right. the issue. Why are you willing to go across to a whole nother continent? What's going on there? Mm -hmm. I think that people, um, you know, I think that the American orientation of and European orientation of, of objectifying people is very strong. And we, so we were taught in this country to uh, organize along racial divides of like who is, who are better people and who are lesser people and who are deserving. And I think that a lot of, um, and I don't call them Caucasians because there's no such thing as like any white folks, European folks and came out of the Caucasus. That's a total myth. Fair and enough, so, <laughs> fair enough. So I just, I just can't, I can't, I can't get, get there anymore, you know, uh, trying to uphold that myth. So I think that what happens is there's a way in which people want to want to um, help in general. They're helpful, they in, intend good things. But the deep divide uh, and split that was in, that initiated this country and is the fundamental design and orientation of this country for there to be anti-Black racism is potent and it's powerful in those same people that intend to help. It's easy to go and help uh, Black folks in as long as they're objectified into a location of poverty, abject poverty, they can't, you know, do anything for themselves. But there, I think, is an underlying belief of like, well, you know, you're here and you've been in this country, so you've had all this opportunity and you're just squandering it away because white folks don't understand the nature of institutional and structural racism and how the system has been not only stacked up against black people. A lot of people like to talk about what's stacked up against white people. What I'd like to talk about is, is how much... Uh, benefits there have been specifically designed and structured for white people over and over and over again as they entered the country, new cultures of people 
were given specific uh, uh, economic advantages that allowed them to con persistently stand above blacks, Latinos, uh, and, and indigenous people in this country. And so we, we, people talk about, and I think we get sort of caught up in this sense of like, oh, the black people are complaining about their experience and, you know, really they're just whining. And it's like, yeah, you know, white folks have like lived in the presence of uh, reparation. It, what was it, like not what, what is it? What is the other thing? Uh, when you get like folks ahead because of their race, privilege <laughs> well yes privilege but you know uh the um i forget the name of it but the term you know that they where people are given the opportunity because of their race they're given special opportunities and that has been since the uh since the des the original design and birth of this country and because we're a historical and a contextual we don't talk about that. So we go and we look at the poor African children over there someplace else. Uh, we can look upon them as objects that, you know, are just needing our help. We do, we do that in this country too. Uh, you know, I want to say that a lot of people that are part of, uh, you know, well-meaning religious communities, including uh, Buddhist communities, are, are you know, quick to go and try to teach something in a prison as long as black folks are behind bars and uh, and put in, in 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 a position of of being caged in. But yeah, as you said, like nary a black crying in their life, not you know, no real relationship. And you know, I want to say that that's that's uh, you know, especially for the white folks that listen to this and 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 colored folks that are listening to this. We have to realize that that is what they've been taught. You know, it's not people are just like bad in their heart and think this way. They've been every way that we think has been come inherited from someplace else. That is the uh, the the deep illness that has been inherit, inherited in this society to objectify black people in this way to objectify black bodies to have hatred and disdain for the experience of black peoples and the people in the African diaspora, in, especially when they have some level of power, but not, uh, but, but are not empowered to do what it is they want to do in their lives. Yes, interesting, because, you know, we talk about it and I look and when, whenever I friend people on social media, you know, especially Facebook that everybody's on, you know, I start looking through and saying, I'm the only black person in their network. Mm -hmm. And I'm a really easy black person to have in their network because then they can talk about their black friend, Dr. Right. Veronica. And I'm <laughs> acceptable because they, it's easy to whitewash me and make them like them. Mm -hmm. um, but yet, um, even so, I don't necessarily feel a welcoming mm -hmm. <laughs> by um, these other communities even though they're quote unquote colleagues but right. so it, it's always an interesting conversation as to why this is going on and everybody's hyper about race these days um, and people feel like something's being taken away from them but i said you know europeans came and they were given free land and free labor free land at thousands of acres and free labor. I couldn't figure out, why does everybody have real estate? Why does everybody, why does everybody have this? They got it for free. For free. And yeah. they got the labor to work it for free. What else can you say is going to put people on top if you have everything for free? So it's just a little bit of the history and the background that we're never taught as mainstream culture is not teaching that that's how it went and certainly people who are african-american latino or all these other cultures that came in later on are not taught how the people at the top got at the top they came in they stole it and they used other people to work it all for free and made themselves lots of money. And now they're telling us that, oh, you're just stupid. And that's why you don't have anything. So that, that narrative is, is, has been frustrating. So now racial Dharma 
It's like two words you put together and it's like- Oh, it's, a, it's actually the title is Radical Dharma. Oh, Radical Dharma. Okay, so I'm saying racial Dharma. So first you got to tell us what Dharma is because that's not a, a standard term in the American lexicon. And then why Radical Dharma? Go yeah. ahead. Uh, so Dharma has a lot of translations. It's a Sanskrit word that's the mother uh, tongue of uh, India. And so many of the Indian languages have roots back to Sanskrit. But Dharma means uh, a, 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 an, an array of things. And that's why we chose to use the word in the title, because really the in the English language, we don't have a word that quite means the the the, the nuanced thing. So it means truth and it means law, and it means the, the way, and it means, um, you know, how, you, how your path unfolds. Uh, we're using it primarily as a sense of truth. And truth, not as in, there's a, not just a capital T truth, like there's some kind of an ultimate truth, but that, there, that each of us have a truth, that uh, when we inhabit that truth, when we allow that truth to be known to ourselves and we access it in a radical way, when we get clear, and that's both as individuals and also in society, then liberation, which is one of the words in the subtitles, talking race, love, and liberation, so then liberation is possible. And, and it's not possible when we're not re in relationship with our truth and with, as we're just talking about in terms of the historical realities of the of America, when we're not in relationship with that truth, then we're stuck and we're liberation as a society and as individuals is not possible. People are living in, in, in just a kind of um, straight jacket of guilt and uh, fear and anger and repression that has to do with not having visited the deep truth of our relationship to race and how this society was built in, in terms of a racial divide that allowed for the advancement of some people on the backs of other people. And it's not just that it happened a long time ago, it was embedded into our social code, into our institutional structures. It is here, it's alive, that history is alive and it's uh, I want to say it's well, and in fact, it's just become more subtle. And so, it, you know, every time we get a Beyonce or an Oprah, you know, everybody like raises their hand. It's like, yeah, like racism was over. We have a black president and, uh, you know, we, we have this sort of, um, we then orient this notion of like the exceptional black people or the exceptional Latinos or the exceptional indigenous people. Like if they did it, anyone can. And, and that's not true. We, you know, the people that succeed, uh, succeed despite the realities of, the, of race in this society. It was never built, the American society was never built to welcome us or to support us or to uplift us. All of the stride, strides that we've made have been because we're creative and in, in, in just genius and uh, have great fortitude and resilience. And I think that America is at a place right now where it is having to reconcile the truth of that, that we're not a, we're not a, uh, our, us Native Americans, Latin, we are not an inferior race. And when you have had people believe in their own superiority and have that confronted I think as we have with having such an elegant, you know, he was not perfect, but an elegant uh, and profound uh, black person at the highest office in the land that really showed a, a, a great deal of grace and dignity. It like blew up people's idea of like, you know, the ape like porch monkey, you know, dark, dangerous black people. It, it, and it threw off people's idea of like their their sense of superiority. It's like, hey, actually, <laughs> you know, those people are pretty damn amazing, and they're grace graceful and gracious, and they're resilient and they're powerful, and their power scares us, and we don't know what to do with that. We haven't had a 
the kind of conversation that lets us all, uh, I want to say, reorganize and renegotiate our positions in, in society, in the social code of society. So what, so Dharma, but radical, radical. Uh, yeah, what's, radical, what's means radical that's, what's, what's radical about it that's different from, okay, so Dharma is a new concept for most right. of us. What's radical about it? The Dharma, yeah. So the, 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 in many ways, the um, radical Dharma is, speaks to the idea that uh, there is a fundamental process and orientation that lives in the Buddhist teachings that would allow us to get down to that truth. But if we cut off part of it and decide, oh, we're only going to look at this part, and that part, that doesn't really serve us to look at. And so one has to be radical. That means uh, radix, the root term is, means complete. So one has to be complete in their pursuit of the truth. They have to be complete. We have to be complete in our willingness to look at, you know, the whole of who we are, what parts we have left behind, and also the whole of who our society is what parts of our society are dark and terrible. Uh, it doesn't mean the society will completely fall apart. It means we have to reconcile that though. Just like we have to reconcile the parts of us that are, um, that are, that are uh, hidden and repressed in our own bodies as you spoke about because they then erupt into illness and we're seeing that illness on a grand scale in terms of a, a conflict within our, the, our internal national body, if you will, right? So we're having a conflict in the body of the society, the, the body of our uh, country, and, and frankly, the body of our planet. Uh, and it, ha it has very much to do with this inability to reconcile these repressed truths. And so radical means to like, go back, go back and dig into the truth. Uh, it will, you know, as they say, set us free. So once we all see the light, <laughs> once we're all radical and admit what the truth is and start really talking about what the truth is, what's the next step? What do you envision can happen once more people start coming to say, here's what's going on, and I admit this is what's going on, what's next? You know, I, I think that one of the things that's fundamental about the Buddhist orientation is the belief in, in the fundamental goodness of people. And I think that racialization and the inability to deal with it, unwillingness and or incomplete, uh, a, you know, grasp of like our, our, the context that, in which we live has hindered that, that fundamental goodness from coming out and being allowed to connect ourselves to each other in a way that race is not our primary divide. I mean, and, and of course that was set up because class was our primary divide. And, and so both race and class are intertwined with each other. So I think that what happens is that we, we shed a lot of this like, you know, 400 year old guilt. We shed a lot of the, you know, 250, uh, 200, 200 year old, um, excuse me, 250-year-old two, resentment. We share uh, another 50 years of, you know, of a sense of failure in terms of like civil rights and how uh, effective it has been or has not been in terms of navigating, you know, great structural racism. I think that what happens is that when, just like anything that happens, when you like really like sit at the table and you have that conversation that you need to be with people, uh, that have uh, affronted you and you have affronted them and you're in a dynamic that it, it begins to clear the space. It doesn't fix everything right away, but it begins to clear the space so that we can be honest with each other. We can be, we can see each other again as human beings rather than simply adversaries or someone that's like out to get me or I'm out to get you. Uh, I think that it lets us be human. I, I think that that's what the next step is, that we get to be human. And, and what our collective humanity being embraced produces, uh, I'm going to let that uh, unfold. I, but I, I trust that it's much better than what we've been living in. So I, I'm looking for 
you know, these truth and reconciliation discussions, <laughs> uh, you know, a la Desmond Tutu, where we can start saying, okay, here's what happened. And people start admitting and stop saying, well, it wasn't me. I wasn't here. Admit what happened and say, okay, well, what can we do to move on the road to help descendants of what happened? So for instance, when, when Georgetown said, we're going to start acknowledging this, that we were built on the backs and let's figure out what we can do. Okay, so at least that we can give them a f people a free education or whatever. We have to start having these discussions, not just saying, I'm sorry, but, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know about the Holocaust and, um, you know, how, how to get reparations for things like that, we're talking people who've come in this country who are still today experiencing issues. And so what do we do to improve these issues really that works? And it's not just about throwing social programs that are inadequate, that keep you on the bottom of society at people, because that's what these, these so many people are making money. The people at the top, who made the system are making money on poor people, on dark people. I just found out my bank is financing prisons and <laughs> I'm so upset and I'm thinking, okay, so what am I going to do about this? So I'm going down to talk to the bank today, but on the other side, in, we started real estate investing and I'm like, you know what, we're buying in some of the sketchy neighborhoods, affordable housing. Instead of my money going into prison, I'm not going to just move it to another institution. It's probably doing the same thing in another way. I just haven't figured it out. Let me invest that money into my community that's actually going to help people have a great place to live for an affordable price. And so what we, we need to start having those conversations. Right. So I'm going to go in your face at the bank, and then I'm going to be on my radio shows talking about this, a la Wells Fargo, who I'm so pissed. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... Where can we find you? Your book is it is it in on Amazon? How yeah, it's on Amazon. It's in bookstores. It's great if you if you love local bookstores. It's great to walk into the bookstore and ask them to carry the book. Or why don't they have the book if they don't have the book? Uh, but it's also on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and online. You can go to uh, radicaldharma.com. And I have a website at angelkyotowilliams.com and that's K-Y-O-D-O. -O. So angel, K-Y-O-D-O, williams.com. Um, and you, know, you can get to most of the information there. Um, infinitely, you know, Google knows everybody. So you can also just, if you can't scribble those things down, you can just go ahead and uh, type my name or Radical Dharma's name into Google and you'll be able to find plenty of information. And of course, yeah. people who watch and, and listen will know that in the show notes, of course, we will have all the links yeah. <laughs> so they won't have to um, scribble down and worry. They can just Great. finish listening and click the link. So Reverend Angel Coyoto Williams, thank you so much for the conversation. Thank you, Veronica. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the Wellness Revolution podcast. If you want to hear more on how to bring wellness into your life, visit drveronica.com. See you all next week. Take care.